Now I'm ready. We need to make a fresh start. We need a fresh start in our lives. We need a fresh start in the church. And Jesus wants to help us make a fresh start. John chapter 10 and verse 10 is the key scripture that I want us to have in our minds. I hope that it will resonate throughout this morning's message and our time together. I want to invite you to stand together with me in reverence for the word of the Lord. And let's read aloud uh, this verse of scripture uh, taken today from the voice translation. Let's read together. I came to give you life with joy and abundance. Let's read it one more time like you really mean it. I came to give you life with joy and abundance. Now I invite you to hold up your copy of the scriptures and uh, say this prayer together with me. Say, Lord Jesus, give me eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that is willing to obey your word. I need your joy. I need your abundance. Fill me, I pray. And everybody says amen. 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 You can be seated. Jesus said, I came to give you life with joy and abundance. Jesus wants to give us the fullness of life and life everlasting. Now, how many of you know that every one of us wants to live a good life, but the reality is... While we may set out to achieve some goals, we, we have some dreams and ambitions, things that we want to accomplish. While we set out to live a good, even a great life, all too soon, obstacles begin to get in the way. Yeah. Obstacles of all kinds of shapes and sizes block us from achieving the good life that we desire. Sometimes those obstacles... Uh, might seem trivial to some. Maybe it's just a financial issue. Maybe you uh, lost your first job. Anybody remember the first job you lost? Anybody heard those words? You're fired. Okay. You know, I, I, I remember when I lost a job, I quickly went home and chopped down two trees. You know, I had to take my frustration out on some, somebody somewhere, and the tree seemed as good a candidate as anybody. <laughs> Obstacles get in our way. Yeah. Sometimes it might be a health issue. That's a little bit more ser serious when maybe your own personal health begins to prevent you from achieving the things that you want. It's a sickness. It's, a, it's, a, it's an illness that doesn't go away. The doctors tell you it's cancer. The doctors tell you it's tuberculosis. The doctors give you a bad report. And it seems to become that obstacle. Sometimes we deal with the obstacle of death and grief. And, and, and it, it prevents us from, from moving forward. We get stuck in that place of loss. And the reality is, whatever the obstacle, whether it be a large obstacle or a small obstacle, how many of you know sometimes we just learn to live with the obstacle? You remember the story of the princess and the pea, don't you? Yeah. You know, she, she, she had a pea-sized pebble that was in her mattress, and it, and it kept her awake at night. And she would add mattress to mattress to mattress, but no matter how much she stacked up the mattresses, there was still the obstacle. There was still the pea-sized pebble that kept her from sleeping. Sometimes we just live with the obstacle and try to make it through life anyway. What are some obstacles that keep us from experiencing the fullness of life? I want to uh, present to you that this morning the reality is, for some of us, the biggest obstacle that we hurdle in our life is that we try to live without God. Even here in America, where we are supposed to be a quote-unquote Christian nation, people don't really have a personal relationship with God. Jesus said, I came to give you life, life that is full of joy, full of abundance, and yet there are some who don't acknowledge that Jesus is God, okay. that he's the one who wants to give them life. And so if we are going to overcome the obstacle in our life, if we're going to get around this and begin to experience the fullness of life that Jesus desires for us and the good life that we want, can I suggest to you that, this, that the place that we need to be for a fresh start is that we need to start with God. Amen. We need to make a fresh start with God. 
The reality is, as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 2, he said, I mean that you have been saved by grace through believing, and you did not save yourselves. I need to stop right there for a second, because some of us have been trying with all of our own energy and all of our own might, might to do all of the right things to, to make, uh, make it on our own. I mean, after all, we're Americans, we're going to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, right? We can make it if I just try harder, if I work longer, if I have more money. I'm going to do it. I'm going to make it. But Paul's telling us that we have been saved, that we have come into a good life, not because of anything we could do, but it was a gift from God. It's not the result of your own efforts, so nobody can brag about it. I can't stand up this morning as the pastor and say, you know, hey, if you would just be more like me. You know, I, I, I fast and I pray and, and uh, I tithe and I do all the right things. Look at what I do. If you would just do like what I do, then you would be okay too. No, I'm not saying because of any good work, any good thing that I might try to do. Instead, we are all saved by grace. We are brought to that place of faith where we acknowledge Jesus came and he came for me. Amen. He came for me. He came to give me life. The starting place for all of us is to start with God. And the reality is, for us as a church, the starting place is we can't do it on our own. We have to start with God. We need God to help us as a church. There's a second obstacle, though. We, we, we may have come to a place where we've agreed, yeah, I need God in my life. But the reality is we move into another obstacle, and that's that we try to make it alone. We try to go through life by ourselves without other people being intimately involved in our life. We don't really have real connections. We are isolated. We are uh, the ever popular Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way. I'm doing it on my own. I'm, I'm going to make it by myself. And, and some of us get comfortable living life in isolation, living by ourselves. And yet the reality is we need each other. If we're going to make a fresh start, we need to start with God. And we need to realize that it is together and never alone. Paul wrote again in Ephesians 2, he said, Though we were spiritually dead because of the things we did, God, uh, did against God, He gave us new life with Christ. You have been saved by grace. What does that have to do with living and, and being Together. Notice it does not say, though I was spiritually dead because of the things I did against God, he gave me a new life in Christ, and I have been saved by God's grace. We. It's about us. It's about we. The reality is, we within the church need each other. We can never do it alone. And yet, can I tell you that some of the most superficial relationships in America are within the church. They're not down at the local bar. I dare say, you know, because Satan counterfeits everything good that God wants. And God knows that we need each other. And so the local bar is a counterfeit of the church in that it presents a place where people can begin to try to re relate and connect with each other. And I dare say there are some people in local bars who are better at connecting and being in a, an authentic relationship with each other than we are within the church. Jesus said that the world will know that we are his disciples because we keep all his commandments. Because we do all the right things. Because we're good people. Because we go to church on Sunday morning. Jesus said, they'll know you are my followers because you love each other. With a genuine, authentic love that cannot be broken. A love that's deeper than you can find in a counterfeit church of any shape or size. We need to love each other. And so, if you've come to that place of an obstacle in your life, you can try to live it on your own. I mean, 
I grew up with the, my favorite Bible verse, Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And I'm like, thank you, God. You're doing a good work in me. But you know what? The Lord tapped me on the shoulder and went, son, would you look at that verse just a little bit more closely? Being confident of this, Paul said, he who began a good work in all yins, all y'all, every one of you, not a singular you, but the plural you, the group. And so if he's going to continue the work that he started in me, you know what? It means I have to be in relationship with other believers. And the moment I break and cut off relationship with other believers, I'm preventing God from doing the work that he wants to do in me because I'm trying to do it alone. It's not enough to just come to a relationship with God. We have to come into a relationship with each other. Amen. But there's another obstacle that gets in our way. Some of us will agree, yeah, we need each other. We need, we need to get connected. We need to uh, love each other the way Jesus wants us to love each other. But then we run into this obstacle in that we try to live in a holy huddle. Us four and no more. I mean... I'm saved, and my best friends are saved, and I dare say some of us haven't made a new friend in about, well, since the day you got saved. We don't know how to cross the street and talk to our neighbor. We don't know how to uh, reach out and talk with the people that serve us at the bank or at the grocery store or uh, at a movie theater that we visit. Those acquaintances stay just that. And acquaintance. We never take the time to get to know them as they are. We never find out if they have a need in their life that we can pray with them about. We're only concerned about our holy huddle. My closest friends are all Christians. And we're all on our way to heaven. And we're all healthy and feeling great. And aren't you glad to be saved in a part of life church today? If we're honest, that's exactly how some of us think. We don't think about the people that are outside the four walls of the church. We only think about ourselves. We're selfish. Because we have the obstacle of the holy huddle in, in our minds and in our lives. And yet the reality is if we're going to make a fresh start, we not only need to start with God and realize that we need each other together, never alone, but we have to ask outsiders to come in. There we go. Ask outsiders to come in. Again, Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 talks about the reality of including those outside the church. He reminds us of where we started out. In the past, you were spiritually dead. Again, that's a plural you. That's not a singular you. He's talking to the church. He's talking to all of us as believers. You were spiritually dead because of your sins and the things you did against God. Yes, in the past, you lived the way that the world lives, following the ruler of the evil powers that are above the earth, that the that same spirit is now working in those who refuse to obey God. In the past, all of us lived among them, trying to please our sinful desires, doing all the things our bodies and minds wanted. We should have, we should suffer God's anger because we were sinful by nature. We were the same as all the other people. Paul reminds us, first of all, the reality: we used to be just like them. And if we used to be just like them, guess what? We ought to be able to identify with them because we know the struggles that they have. We, we understand what it is to have a God-spaced vacuum in your heart because it doesn't matter how frequently you go to a bar and drink. It doesn't matter how much drug you may do. It doesn't matter how much you get hooked on pornography and look at those different kind of things. It doesn't matter if you're addicted to food and want more and more to eat. It doesn't matter if you're addicted to sports and, you know, you've taken time out of your busy schedule today and taken a break from the Olympics. God bless you for being here. Uh, I hope you've got it on your TiVo, you know, so that you don't miss anything coming out of Rio. It doesn't matter what we try to fill our lives with. Whatever the stuff of the world is, we all ought to know as believers it's never enough. You always want more. We can identify with them. And so Paul reminds us, you, just, you used to be just like them. God's made you alive. But remember, they're just doing what they know to do. They're following the rules, the mindset of this world. And we need to ask them to come and join us. We need to extend the invitation. 
Because otherwise, we're going to stay at that place. There's going to be an obstacle that keeps us from being those that God wants us to be. Now, I want you to know that you, you may be here today and you may not be a Christian, uh, and that's okay. We, we love you just the way you are. But the reality is, you still need new friends. When, you know, why, why is it supposed to be that we only just have this many friends? The scriptures tell us that in the abundance of counselors, there's wisdom. That, it, that as we come to, to find more and more friends, they have more and more life experience that's different from ours, and we can benefit from having new friends. We all need to learn that art and include others, but especially within the church. But there's still another obstacle that gets in our way, and that is the reality that sometimes we try to live life on cruise control. We think that we've made it. We, we somehow have the mistaken belief that we've arrived. Have you ever felt that way? <clears throat> oh, come on. You have to, because after all, you look at some people and you say, I'm better than they are. Oh, I forgot to tell you, this is when we're honest with each other on Sunday morning. Because James told us that when we look into the Word of God, we're supposed to see ourselves for who we really are. The problem is too often we, we see ourselves, don't like what we see, and we go away and we forget what we look like. And we don't really change. The reality is, some of us live life on cruise control. We think we've arrived. We think we've made it. We don't have to, we don't have to do anything. Because, hey, I've got my ticket to heaven, and I'm going to be okay. The reality is, each and every one of us, as we start with God, we have to respond continually to God. Again, Ephesians 2, verses 6 to 8. And he, speaking of God, he raised us up with Christ and gave us a seat with him in the heavens. He did this for those in Christ Jesus, so that for all the future time he could show the very, very riches of his grace by being kind to us in Christ Jesus. Respond to God. He has given us a seat in the heavenlies, but it, he, he's placed us there so that for all time he wants to continue to show the riches of his grace and his mercy and his kindness. We need to be responding to God. We can't just live on cruise control and think that we've arrived. We need to continue to let his grace be working in us. I wish that were the end of the story, but there is yet one last obstacle that gets in our way, and it's especially true for us as Americans. Lots of us live like pack rats. Yeah. Are you a hoarder? You know, you just have to have more stuff. You can't let go of anything. I might need that someday. I, I, I might, I might uh, put that to good use. And so I hold on to it. And we hold tightly to all the things and all the money and every good blessing that God gives us. We just grip it with a death grip. It's mine. I mean, after all, isn't that not the first word that all of us learned when we were, you know, a year and a half, two years old? Mine. Mine. Go ahead. You'll feel better. All together, on three, everybody say mine. One, two, three. Mine. 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 Don't you feel better? Okay. And yet the reality is we can get stuck with that mentality that I'm going to live like a pack rat. I'm going to hoard and I'm going to keep everything for myself. And yet the reality is the more that I have, how many of you know the more you have, the more you want? You're never satisfied. You can never have enough. And so the reality is if we are going to make a fresh start, we need to come to the place where we are willing to make the T3 investment. Yes. How many, how many of you know you want to make a return on what you, what you invest in? I mean, even if I go down to the bank and I have some money on deposit at the bank, uh, I'm not real happy with only getting three to five pennies a month for the money that I have in the bank. But you know what? Three to five pennies on the plus side is a whole lot better than three to five pennies on the minus side. I'm glad to get some kind of return on my free checking account. It's not just free. They pay me to keep my money here. Not a lot, but I'm getting a return on my investment. 
We need a T3 investment. Ephesians 2.10 says God made us what we are in Christ. God made us to do good works that God planned in advance for us to do, uh, planned for us to live our lives doing. It's a problem when you read a different translation from what you used to you stumble over the words. Because um, you want to say it the way you're used to. Uh, the reality is... <coughs> God wants us and has planned good works for us that he wants us to invest our lives. The T3, he wants us to invest, first of all, our time. Many of us know sometimes we only have time for ourselves. And then we don't have enough time. We're going to do the things we want to do and our schedule is busy and we, and we never really achieve the time that we want. When you begin to invest your time in, in the things that are eternal and begin to use your time for God, you begin to see, I've got more than enough time. Because you begin to get an invest, a return on your investment of the time that you give away instead of hoarding all your time for yourself. Not only do we need to be willing to invest our time, but we need to be willing to invest our talents. God has gifted every one of us in different ways, and he wants us to use our lives to be a blessing for others. Amen. Pastor Barker has shared needs that they have, of uh, those who might have administrative gifts, of those who have a heart for kids, of those who, uh, you know, can do certain things. You might think, well, I, I could never, has God gifted you or haven't, hasn't he? Maybe it's not to go to Thailand, but maybe it's just to be willing to be used right here where you are. Yeah. He's gifted us to make an investment. And when you begin to use your talents, you begin to see that God blesses you with more ability that it never runs out. That's what he desires for our lives. And then... Not only do we need to invest our time and our talent, but we also need to be willing to invest our treasures, our finances. And yet this is where, you know, this is where it really gets hard. I'd rather keep it for myself. I'd rather, I'd rather have what I want, so I'm going to take my treasure and I'm going to enjoy that meal at the restaurant, but not only am I going to enjoy that meal, I'm going to have a... a, a unlimited refill of pop or iced tea or whatever beverage I want because it's mine. Yep, our family for years has said, no, we can, we can drink water with lemon because they don't charge us for that and that gives us more money we can invest eternally into giving to missionaries. Water's pretty good. But i got to have my pop. The moment you say you gotta is the moment you realize I'm a hoarder. I'm only thinking about myself yeah. and what I want and what pleases me. And we need, to, we need to, to realize that everything that we have financially, everything that we have materially is a blessing from God. As scripture says, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. I came into this world with absolutely nothing. And I'll leave the world that way too can't take anything with me, <laughs> except for when I store up treasures in heaven. The T3 investment, an investment of my time, an investment of my talents, an investment of my treasure that I can give as God would want me to give. And so the question for all of us individually and as a church is, isn't it time for a fresh start? Isn't it time that we say, Lord, I'm tired of the way my life has been lived. Jesus, I don't pretend to understand it all. Maybe you can agree. You don't know it all. Go ahead, say it with me. I don't know it all. But one thing I do know. I need a fresh start with God. Individually and corporately as a church, I, I need, we need a fresh start with God. Start with God. We're saved by grace. It's the gift of God. Are you in that place in your life where you've tried to live without God? Maybe today is the day that you take that, in, that step of faith and say, Jesus, I need you. I, I don't understand what, it's gonna, what, what the difference is going to make, but I, 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 I know I've been trying to do it on my own far too long. Jesus, I need you. Can you acknowledge today that you need other people in your life? <coughs> That we need to be together in this thing and not on our own? Can you agree that 
It's important for us to make new friends and ask outsiders to join us. Can you agree that we need to continually respond to God? And that, yeah, God has blessed me with time, talent, and treasure, and I need to make a T3 investment. I need to stop being a pack rat. Stop hoarding so that these obstacles get out of the way and I can really make a fresh start. We're, we're all at different places. No, no two of us probably are facing the same obstacle, even in the same way. But will we today say, yes, Lord, I need to make a fresh start. God is still the God of new beginnings. He is still the God who takes the old and makes it new. Takes what's dead and makes it alive. Some of us, while we may be spiritually dead, we're just living a routine. And we may as well be dead. Because nothing changes. Nothing moves forward. We're just going through the motions. In what way do you need a fresh start today? Jesus wants to bring the resurrecting power of his spirit into your life. I want to invite Sean and Pearl, the worship team, to come. They're going to lead us in the worship chorus to respond to the Lord. These altars this morning are open for you to make a commitment to the Lord. If you need to respond to Jesus today and make that initial commitment to say, I don't know, how, I don't know what it means, but I need to respond and simply say yes to Jesus. It would be my privilege today to just be able to pray with you to find faith in Christ and make a fresh start with Him. And so I want to invite all those who want to just find a place of prayer here at the front. And if you, if you need Jesus, come tug on my sleeve and let me pray with you.